program. I mean, it is the end of the semester, right? Okay. Last time we talked about chapters 11 and 12. Today we have to talk about chapters 13, 14, 15, and just to make myself sound ridiculous on the recording, let's say 16, 17, and 18 too. The final three chapters of, of uh, the Wanderings of Odysseus, the second part of Ulysses, as well as the third part, so-called Nostos, with the Umaeus chapters, the Ithaca chapter, and the Penelope chapter, where we finally get to hear the voice of Molly Bloom. Um, and unfortunately, I will myself not have much time to explain that which she says. So I encourage you to read, read, and read again in chapter 18. So chapter 13, let's begin with this idyllic pastoral um, uh, bit of prose from it. Also note that it is 8 p.m. at night. Blaze is boiling. And Molly Bloom, we're supposed to meet at 4 p.m. And Bloom, in the last chapter, noticed that the plot and so, or rather, notices in this chapter that his watch has stopped at 4.30 p.m. It's now 8 p.m. We saw him last time. Sometime after 5 p.m. in Cyclops, the Cyclops chapter. And so now he has had two hours to himself to reflect on what, um, what has happened at his time. Uh, these are hours that are denied to us in this text, and it is up to your own speculation what happened, uh, what has happened. Uh, and what has gone on in the mind of Bloom. Perhaps you can write a play or a novel yourself someday about these two undiscovered hours. Perhaps you will, like the narrator of Don Quixote, find the Cide Hum uh, Benengeli, uh part of this manuscript, which has been lost as it were. Um, in any case, the summer evening had begun to fold the world in its mysterious embrace. This is the style. This is the style of pastoral. This is a beautiful style. And uh, uh, an easier to understand style than what we'll see in the, uh, the Parago of, of chapter 14, as well as the Mishmash and Phantasmagoria of chapter 15. Far away in the west, the sun was setting in the last glow of all too fleeting day, lingered lovingly on the sea and strand. There's that masterful alliteration. On the proud promontory of dear old house guarding, it's ever the one. Okay. On the weed grown rocks along the sandy mount shore where Stephen the Devils had walked earlier in chapter three, Proteus. And last but not least, on the quiet church whence there streamed forth at times and upon the stillness, a voice of prayer to her who is in her pure radiance, a beacon ever to the storm tossed heart of man, Mary, star of the sea. A um, couple of things to note about this chapter is those of you who are thinking about modernist techniques, it is itself bifurcated into two different perspectives. First, the perspective of Gertie McDowell, who is the young, beautiful, though unfortunately lame lady who is bringing friends to Sissy Caffrey, Edie Borman, uh, uh, Borman, excuse me, and is there uh, also with Tommy Caffrey and his twin brother, who are babies, and make baby sounds during the course of this text. The second half of the chapter, after Bloom has finished his uh, onanism, uh, switches back to Bloom. And so we get two different perspectives, but something interesting about Gertie McDowell's perspective here, and something uh, that may underlie her feelings towards William are the fact that we hear in the chapter before that uh, that uh, Gertie McDowell loves the boy with the bicycle. This is Reggie Wiley. He has apparently spurned her in some way or another. So she's hurting. And the same with Bloom is now hurting. And so they're figures. This would be sort of like if you're sitting on the quad studying and you see somebody afar, you can speak to them. They occupy a place in your heart, or perhaps a library. Oh, wow, that person's separated by four large tables, and I'll never go beyond those tables, but this moment is And this is sort of the voyeuristic relationship that they have. One thing I want to mention to you is that much of our understanding of Bloom has been mitigated through the, uh, the perception of other characters. One thing you may have noticed is that you do not know what he looks like. Very different from uh, more contemporary novels. And once you see him through the eyes of Gertie McDowell, you find that he's a dark, boring looking, handsome man. How many of you in your mind's eye were imagining that Bloom was handsome? Right. I mean, I'm not saying that you thought he was ugly necessarily, but did you really think 
when you were hearing these anti-Semitic comments by the citizen, seeing his interactions with Martin Cunningham, hearing him talked about by McCoy and Lenahan and addressed even by Miles Crawford in such a boisterous way, which uh, I always like the fact that when he's trying to throw Bloom out, Bloom smiles at him. He knows the smile is from. He knows how There's something uh, that suggests Bloom is a cut above uh, the norm. And yet he, something, something that may have very well attracted him to Molly is that not only is she physically attractive as well as, of course, being a singer, puts herself on display, a great opera singer. Um, uh, Bloom is not only intelligent and cultured, but pretty good looking. And perhaps more importantly, does not look like a normal Irish. He doesn't look like the common person around there. It looks different, looks foreign, looks exotic to some extent. Very similar to uh, the Raoul uh, character from Sweets of Sin, who's himself described as dark and foreign. So Gertie McDowell, who was seated near her companions, lost in thought, easy, far away into the distance, was in very truth as fair a specimen of winsome Irish girlhood as one could wish to see. She was pronounced beautiful by all who knew her, though. Though, as folks often said, she was more gill trapped than a McDowell. Nice bit of realism in that detail there. Um, and so, Gertie McDowell feels the stare of Bloom on her. These two hurting in individuals. And in fact, one, uh, one moment, she, she can tell that she's raised the devil meaning that he has become uh, sexually aroused while looking at her, and she plays into this. Uh, similarly to, or perhaps parallel to the fact that Nausicaa, uh, who uh, Gertie McDowell is written in analogy to here, or parallel to Nausicaa, the Nausicaa episode in the Odyssey, Nausicaa wakes up and she's sent a dream by Athena that reminds her that a young suitor might show up this very day to see her. So she should go to the river and wash her clothes. So she just has to go to the father. She says, Father, can I go wash my clothes? And she doesn't say why, but he knows why. He knows that her his little daughter is going to become a woman soon and leave him. And she's a little shy about mentioning this to him. I don't know how many of you have fathers and you have brought a boy home to him. And perhaps you felt a lot of anxiety about what your father would say and do. And I assure you now that probably he felt even more anxiety than you did. Um, uh, and you, uh, you will understand this as uh, as you, like I, have aged. Um, in any case, the devil has been raised in, in blue. What is it that he sees in this girl? What is it that she sees in him? I encourage you to see that they don't see anything really in each other. They don't understand each other. They both serve as projective functions for the other. In the same way that Gertie McDowell is now hurting because the, the boy with the bicycle, Reggie Wiley, has spurned her. She now sees Bloom as this heroic uh, figure that she can now offer her, her, um, her love to. In fact, uh, uh, one thing she says about him very early, or thinks about him when she first sees him is he had the saddest face she had ever seen. There's something about this that calls out to her and her, her sort of maternal but also sort of spousal instincts to try and heal this man and to think that she in a sort of inflated fashion has the capacity through her love to heal such a complicated and difficult man. On the other end, what is Bloom seeing this young girl? He doesn't even recognize that she's late. He's imagining something about her. She is herself uh, a, a, in sort of like Helen or, or Marguerite from Faust a pure sexual object for, for Bloom. And so both of them objectify each other and just play a role in each other. But if it all, all the world's a stage and we are the married fools who play our, or we are the fools who play our married parts, is paraphrase, not quite right, uh, Shakespeare quote. But um, in this moment, they play roles that seem necessary for each other, but do they attain understanding of one or the other? Um, it doesn't seem so. And in fact, after Bloom has finished and we revert to his perspective from Gertie, Gertie McDowell's perspective, and, and we've seen the fireworks that uh, accompany the, uh, the, uh, the moment of climax for, for Bloom, he sees her get up and to walk away 
uh, with the limp that she has. And in fact, instead of being outraged by this and thinking that she had tricked or deceived him in some way, it's so much worse when a woman has a, a physical disability than a man, which is uh, uh, perhaps untrue, perhaps true, but in any case, it is a it is a sort of a paternal, uh, a kind, not a kind thought, but an empathetic, sympathetic thought that he has, rather than an engaged personalist thought. In any case, after the scene, I shifted back to this perspective. We get what's really on Orleans. All that for nothing, bold hand, Mrs. Marion. Remember, the bold hand belongs to work. Raises Boylan, the same way as Boylan, his hands have been on. Mrs. Marion by at this point. Did I forget to write address on that letter? Like the postcard I sent to Flynn, he's bought stationery during the course of the day and sent a letter to Martha Clifford. And the day I went to Drimmy's without a necktie, angle with Molly, it was put me off. Thinks about Molly. Uh, just a nice detail where he, he forgotten to wear a necktie because he'd gone to a fight with his wife. Very realistic detail. No, I remember Richie Goulding, he's another uncle of uh, Stephen, weighs on his mind. Funny. Watch stopped at half past four. Thus, sharp liver, oil they could use. Plenty of practice often. Could do it myself. He's done plenty of himself in this chapter. Say, was that just when he? There's this comma. She. Punctuation. Uh, James Joyce, for all his lack of punctuation, was a master. Oh, he did. In, to her. She did. Done. Ah, what is he thinking about in this moment? He is thinking about the fact that Rose's Portland has finished, has climaxed into his, uh, has experienced climax with his wife. This is, is what he was thinking about as he committed the thought. He seems to have been seeking some form of relief from his day and from the thoughts that plague him, and yet we see thoughts come right back to him. So this is a temporary uh, respite for him, a respite that doesn't seem to last very long at all. And so we need to move on to chapter 14 in the Oxen of the Sun. This is a giant uh, 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 morass collage of difficult, and it is stuffed full of English prose history, including English chronicles, as well as um, the uh, uh, James Joyce supposedly was looking at a diagram of the development of a fetus during the course of this uh, chapter. So it, is all, it also features, so it features in parallel the development of the English language as well as the development of a human embryo or fetus. Um, and so it is stuffed full. So when it is called oxen of the sun, we understand this as, a, as an analogy to Odysseus's oxen of the sun episode where Circe had told Odysseus and his crew not to go to Threnakia, Isle of the Sun, because there, there were the holy oxen of the sun that if they were killed and eaten, you would surely die, Odysseus, because Apollo loves them great. Apollo is Helios' high hero. They were originally distinct from each other, but the names mean all the same person, uh, character in the Odyssey. Hyperion was the god of the sky, Helios was the god of the sun, Apollo becomes god of all of those. Things. Um, so this is sometimes called a foraginous chronicle based on the Latin word forago, which means a huge mix of things. Oh, I should also say that, uh, let's see, that last time my classical training failed me and I said uh, that, that the uh, fugue chapter was a, a fugum ad canonum. It is in fact a fuga per. Oh, no, 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 I had thought the fugo was a uh, second declension neuter noun. It is, in fact, a first declension feminine noun, and I got the preposition wrong. I said odd, which means two, per, means sort of through. Uh, oh, no, no, my God. So, nice correction to me there. In any case, Richard Elman, the great biographer of, of um, James Joyce, says that Joyce spent 1,000 hours writing this chapter over three months. And so I warned you that chapter three, Proteus was very difficult. This chapter 14 is very difficult. And chapter 15, which I did not require you to read, also very difficult, though I will tell you some uh, salient things about it. Um, 
on this island, Odysseus eventually goes to sleep. The men have to wait a month um, while the winds attempt to settle or while the winds settle to, uh, to move their ship away again. During this month, they start to starve. In Rilicus, the brother-in-law of Odysseus convinces the men that there is no worse death than to die of starvation. So what do they have to fear from the gods? They'll just be killed in a less onerous way, a less shameful, dolorous way. And so they eat the cattle of the sun, and then a very creepy thing happens. The skins of the cattle start to crawl and move into mold. Um, creepy. And then the, the winds switch direction. All the men return to the ship. The ship is hit by a thunderbolt by Zeus, and only Odysseus survives on a plank, but then makes its way to Egidia, where he spends seven years with Calypso prior to the events which begin the Odyssey itself. In this chapter, Oxen of the Sun and Ulysses, Bloom and Stephen meet in the National Hospital in Dublin, where Amina Purefoy is finally going to have her child in the middle of the chapter. Stephen and his friends note that this is 10 p.m. are already boisterously drunk. They're in the intern's lounge or in the guest's waiting room. And while they are speaking, we have a chance to see Bloom observe Stephen uh, in a similar way to what he has been doing all throughout the day, even going all the way back to Hades chapter where he observed Stephen uh, while he was in carriage with his with his father, Simon. Um, but he thinks he's the best of the lot. There's a thought that recurs in his mind over the next couple chapters, that there is something special about Stephen. In the same way that perhaps we discover through the thoughts of Molly Bloom in chapter 18, that there is something special about Bloom. Something I really wish for you to think about, to, to, to cogitate upon, to ponder, and ponder is good, to be ponderous, it comes, uh, it's the word that becomes pound as well. So it's to really think about, to, to really weigh something I mean, is to ponder something is, do you think the comments of denigration and belittling that have surrounded Bloom the entirety of this text are really indications of the fact that the people around him see him as superior to them? Are they criticizing him because they think he is inferior to them? or because there is something different, perhaps better about him, which they refuse to acknowledge in their words, but cannot help but acknowledge in their emotions and in their minds. I just put that to you, uh, that perhaps it is the case that people insult, not when they dislike a thing because it is worse than what it is, but that they dislike it precisely because it is better than what they are and that makes them feel inferior. And so uh, that could be wrong. And it could be wrong yeah, as applied to this situation. But it is something I think worth, again, weighing in one's mind, pondering. Mina Purefoy, as I said, who was in her third day of labor, and remember earlier, sympathetic bloom, it's a third day of labor. That's terrible for her. Be worried about her. Um, the, uh, she finally has her child. Um, and uh, as James Heffernan explains, one of the great scholars of, of Ulysses, um, this chapter is structured to parallel the process of gestation uh, or autogenesis. Uh, genesis means creation or the act of creation. Uh, that that SIS ending in Greek when we get to process. So genesis, kinesis, um, motion, uh, creation. Um, auto means self. So an automobile is something which is self moving. Autogenesis is self creating. So how the fetus develops into what it is. Uh, uh, if you wish to be a lawyer and debate the major issues of our day, this is something that is very much debated. When does a cluster of cells become a human? And there are very different answers, uh, depending on one's particular philosophy or political view, but it, that is the crux of the question, by the way. Where does one define the beginning of life or human life being? And there are many sophisticated responses to that, but they have very much real life applications that make the, make the question far more than just a theoretical one. Of course, of course. Um, uh, and so let's move on to chapter 15. I didn't have you read this because it's 151 pages in, uh, in our copy, the, the Gabler edition of Ulysses. And yet, in some ways, this is the great tour de force, the great climax of the text. It is a written out a closet drama. The names of the characters, the dramatist personae, as they would be in a drama, are, are, uh, are placed above 
them after they or prior to their speech. So in some ways, this is easier to understand than the the other texts uh, or the other chapters in this text. I'll call it the drama. Um, I may not have explained this before. It's the drama that is never meant to be performed. It's only meant to be read. And so, um, this chapter is often, as I said earlier, described as a phantasmagoria. It's hard to keep it straight what's happening and what's what's happening outside the characters' minds and what's happening in the characters' minds. So what do I mean? Circe, the Circe episode in the Odyssey, Odysseus shows up, uh, he makes it to an island that has a name like a scream. It's called Aiaia. And on this island, he sends Eurylochus, again, his brother-in-law, and half of his crew to a home or a place where they see smoke colors. Very much like the, the, the archetype of the witch in the woods. Um, and if you watch the movie The Witch from seven years ago, so uh, you will see this. Uh, you will see this theme played, played out again. And so a few hours later, Eurylochus comes back with no men screaming at Odysseus. In fact, says everything is his fault. He says, our men have been turned to pigs. Odysseus hears this, thinks about killing Eurylochus for criticizing him, thinks better of it, and then makes his way to Circe's house. On his way to Circe's house, Hermes, god of messengers, thieves, communication, uh, even in some ways life and death. It's a very special caduceus, which is a staff of his. Um, looks very much like uh, the caduceus of the American Medical Association. Uh, the uh, rod with sink going up it in wings, that is a catasis. Um, and it, it represents pharmacon. Pharmacon means poison and cure. In, in so the power over life and death as a physician. And so do no harm is there, is great by the that they follow. In any case, um, while on the way to Circe's house, Hermes gives to Odysseus a small plant that is both white and black opposite and it is called mold and this will keep him from being transformed into an animal like his crew when Circe feeds him again not eating the right thing is is dangerous in the Odyssey Lotus oxen and sun get one killed uh thinking that Polyphemus would give them guest gifts after he missed cheese this was an error and then again here Circe can turn one into an animal uh, if you've ever seen spirited away it's obviously basing its transformation on um, this one, uh, consciously or not, um, this is high on the Azaki pill. Um, anyway, not the most uncommon of uh, humans devolving into animals when they give in to a uh, vicious sin like gluttony, for example, or in the case of Stephen. Uh, and this is also gluttony, over drinking, as it were. So, because Odysseus has this divine plant on him, Circe attempts to turn him into an animal, fails to, draws his sword, and then charges her and demands that she turn his men back into humans. She does, and they're actually taller, younger, and more handsome when they are when they get back from their pig um, spa treatment, as it were. The wound in this chapter follows Stephen into a place called Night Town. This is the red light district of Dublin where the houses of ill repute and the ladies of the night were. In fact, I think a very good representation of something very similar to Night Town would be um, Sin City's representation of their red light district, um, which is itself based on uh, a very famous comic book or graphic novelist who was Frank Miller. Frank Miller's he does gritty, darker work. In any case, I think this introduction will introduce you well to the place that we would spend a minute or two here. The Mavic Street entrance of Night Town, before which stretches an uncobbled tram sign set with skeleton tracks, red and green, will o the wisps and danger signals. Will o the wisps are lights that don't lead you to safety but to further danger. They appear in swamps and thinking that they are like a lighthouse that will lead you to safety, they lead you further and further down the wrong path until you can no longer go back. Perhaps you see this as an analog for something like drug age. Perhaps you're right to do so. And rows of grimy houses with gaping doors, rare lamps with quaint rainbow fans, round radiates, halted ice gondola, stunted men and women squabble. They grab wafers between which a witch limps 
coiling copper snow. You saw the alliteration wedged coals, copper sucking. They scatter slowly. Children and the swan come out of the gondola, hiding weird forges on the ground. White and blue under it. The lighthouse whistles, call and answer whistles. And so this is nighttime, the grimy murk with stunted people squabbling and uh, dusky images. And it reminds me a little bit of the descriptions of the darkness that uh, encompasses Dante's in front of this grimy, dark place where dark, where the sorts of things which happen in the dark occur. And so in this chapter, we make it to a house of ill repute where we meet the head, the mistress of this house. Her name is Bella Cohen. Very interesting in this text. Uh, Bloom will give, give up his moly in the same way that uh, Odysseus kept his. He will give up his potato. His potato is apparently the magical item that he's been carrying with him all day. And in fact, one of the prostitutes is touching him and she's like, oh, what's this? Thinking when she is reaching into his pockets, potentially that she's not in fact grasping the potato at first. But then she takes his potato, sees it is potato. And that's when things start to get weird, uh, a little bit surreal in this text. Bloom starts to imagine. He imagines first many, uh, Many of the women he has seen today and in his history indicting him for sexual uh, for sexual advances that he either did or did not commit. Uh, his maid shows back up and she claims that he wanted to fondle her, supposedly though he actually let her go because she stole from him. Um, Josie Powell shows back up. Gertie McDowell shows up and indicts this dirty old man for being so. But then on the other hand, so it seems as if he's been feeling shame throughout the state. He also... Um, it is treated like a hero and he gives a stump speech. And like, um, like Charles Stewart Parnell, is treated as a great figure of political reform. You might see this as the psychoanalytic idea of what's called compensation. During the day, Bloom has been sort of shamed and embarrassed and denigrated by all around him. This, you might imagine, creates in his, his mind uh, an an imbalance, an imbalance that requires that in his unconscious mind, in his imagination, that he be treated like a hero. So what he's missing in his life is true companionship and people seeing him for how valuable he is and how valuable he thinks he is and how valuable he could be if only people knew uh, what he was capable of. And so we see in his imagination what we don't see in his actual life, him being treated like a hero, like someone who is healthy. Uh, like who, in many ways, he truly is, uh, depending on how cynical you cynically you view politics. Perhaps it is the case that Bloom is doing real good uh, around him by trying to take care of Stephen, as well as uh, forgiving the the debts of Hines, as uh, as well as working to get the Dignums their insurance policy. This is somebody that does. And, and, and who makes breakfast for his wife who's going to cheat on him that very day in bed. And so um, I invite you to think about it. That's it. Um, Bloom transforms from a man into a woman. In fact, his pronouns change from him to her. And Bella Cohen changes into Bello Cohen and, does, and, and uh, commits a sadomasochistic act against Bloom. She squeezes him and hurts him to some extent and shames him. This vision becomes a crescendo um, when uh, when Bloom sees Boylan. And Boylan sees, walks by Bloom and says, tells him that he can look in the keyhole while he goes through his wife a few times. It's an ultimate emasculation. He, like a voyeur, like somebody looking at pornography, can watch his wife make a cuckold of him with the man who has been with her on this very day. This, this seems to be uh, one of the larger thoughts that he has carried with him uh, prior to it happening during the course of the day, but also certainly afterwards. And one finally gets to the heart of the matter at the end. In any case, um, at, near the end of this chapter, Bella tries to overcharge Stephen when he knocks over a lamp. Intelligently, Bloom notes that the damages are not as bad as she claims, and so he gives her something of one shell, not a Ten. Uh, Stephen then gets in a drunken disagreement with two soldiers who are very vulgar, and he's saying fairly clever, drunken, intellectual things to them, and they're saying things like, 
I'll have to find it. It's very vulgar, so I'm not going to repeat it in this classroom. Uh, but like he's like, I'll effing kill any bleeding bugger who who talks bad about my king. So these are English soldiers. This is an Irish intellectual, and he doesn't necessarily like them or what they stand for. And uh, so one of them does end up punching Stephen. Two police people show up, and Boom has to tell a couple of clever lies as well as enlist the help of Corny Keller, who is an informant of theirs, to get them to recognize that Stephen is just acting like one of the boys. And so they don't need to put him in their ledger, and they can just go their way, and he can just go his. Um, two things of extraordinary importance to mention in this chapter, though, is that we finally see two figures in the Phantasmagoria that we would be dreading to see. A, Stephen sees his mother, finally. We've heard about him thinking about her, but he sees her now, embodied. She tells him to look. And it really plays on one's sympathy if one reads it closely. She says, who prayed for you and felt for you when you were feeling bad among the strangers? I, this resonates with me, having been educated all over the, the world at this point. Being far from one's home hurts. One longs for home. And especially if you're going through some training, though, you think, well, you know, the people at home, they put their trust in me and I have to do this. And, and she says that when you were feeling this, place, I was loving from afar, like the thoughts that Stephen Dedalus has when he thinks of Cyril Sargent and the love that his mother has. She tells him to repent, to repent. This is very hard um, on him. But uh, perhaps just as bad or even worse, at the very end of the chapter, Bloom sees uh, an elven boy around 11 years old in Eden suit, reading right to left. Do you know what that means, reading right to left? You read left to right in so far as you read English. Any of you know? Yes? No? That's, cl that's not a clever idea. It means that he's reading a language that is read right to left. The Semitic languages are read right to left, either in Arabic, but more importantly, in this case, Hebrew, he's kissing the pages. So he's a very cultured young man who can read Hebrew and he's probably reading the scriptures. And so he's this perfect young man, but he's just an image. He's just what Bloom imagines. And so that's what we get of Bloom. Okay, um, I'm going to end this now, and then I'm going to do the other three chapters later because I have to, and because we need to let uh, uh, Ralph L. Get, introduce us to the Magic Mountain. But know that we'll pause on the, the very, very end of this text, and I may do it asynchronously prior to Friday. I don't know. It depends on how excited I get to give this material to you. Perhaps I'll put it out even today. And those of you who are watching here, well, you'll find out.